What's going on, everyone? Preston Stewart and Sayer Payne with War Stories, joined today by Artie Guerrero. Sir, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for having me. This is, uh, I'm sure, going to be very informative to those veterans that have earned benefits and uh, John Doe America, who knows absolutely nothing about Veterans Administration. Well, yeah, so I had no idea. I, I got your brief outline um, from Kim at, uh, at BetFest talking about uh, a, a brief history of your service in Vietnam. And I thought for sure that was probably what we ended up talking about here. Um, and I think it's worth getting a little background on you, your, you know, your time in the military. But I want to make sure we leave at least half of it for what you've done for veterans upon return, because we just spent almost 30 minutes talking about that before you record. I had no idea it was that much. There's, I just gave you some brief on it. I'm there, sure. There's much more. There's, uh, you're talking April 23rd, this coming next year will be 57 years ago. I got shot in Vietnam and I have been advocating and fighting the VA that all interim. So getting shot in Vietnam instead of uh, doing what with the Ringling Brothers? Was that what you'd said earlier? I was supposed to be, a, I was an accomplished gymnast here in high school. Uh, it's always amazing that uh, how quick life can change. And I, before we even get into any of our stuff, never take the health of a body for granted. It can change so fast. And so many times you have to learn to live all over again. I live in Colorado, which is ski country, USA. And I lived here and I became a gymnast and never learned how to ski, never got up on the mountain once. Then when I was 22 years old and wounded, I had to learn to live all over again. And one of them, I remember so much when I first got shot, April 23rd was the first words out of my mouth is, oh my God, I just want to die because I knew what I was before. And all of a sudden I have all these bullet holes in me. And all of a sudden they're, where am I going to go with this? As it turns out, I got back after not the VA and not a few other people, but dear friends of mine that said, uh, and one good doctor, I have to admit, and I have to, and, and the whole process of everything you hear me talk about, we've never really complained about the, the, the service of a doctor or a nurse or a caregiver. We always bitched about the process, why it took a year to hire a damn nurse or $10,000 below income or a doctor or, uh, you know, it's just ridiculous when you have six jillion guys coming back from war and they don't have the facility nor the up-to-date equipment to be taken care of or taken care of, period, send them out to another place. So the process was never, was the question. Uh, uh, I, I, I'll go back, I'll regress now, but uh, it's just so important to learn how to live. Don't take your good health for granted. Sure. Um, uh, yesterday, is a uh, well, yesterday is a memory, tomorrow's a miracle. And, Today is truly a bitch. We in Vietnam had a raw, raw deal, a very raw deal. And I see one of the questions in your questionnaire, and we'll get to that, how I felt when I came back. It was the worst feeling of my whole life. It was worse than getting shot. And I'll elaborate on that a little bit other, but I'd like to, uh, if you want me to keep talking, I'd like to go into your outline because I Let's think do it. it's outstanding. And the first question was, why, uh, when and why did uh, you join the military? Well, if you remember the, the first two years of Vietnam, you had the draft that was still in process, meaning that if you turn 18, you had to go downtown to your federal office and register with the draft. And you were, you, you were uh, a chosen, if, if necessary, you had to go. And that's where I fell into it. I, I could have actually got out of it because there were a lot of uh, exemptions, exemptions from Vietnam. First of all, if you were married, you didn't have to go. If you had a child, you didn't have to go. If you were the son of a politician, you didn't have to go. If you were in college, you didn't have to go. Hell, if you just didn't want to go, you just had to go to Canada to like 500,000 did. They went to Canada and yet, you know, you had your sure. choice to do what you wanted to do. I chose to go. I got married, I had a divorce, and I had a daughter, so I could have got out of there. I had a future with the circus. I still chose to go. Uh, there were some other personal domestic situations. I had a younger brother who was ready, was 18, and he would have gone. Mom said, well, you, you kind of messed your life up here a little bit, Already, why don't you go? I went, and it was 
good timing. I mean, it was meant to be, but my brother ended up going too. He was in the Dominican Republic trying to help situate that political crap out. Uh, in the interim, that it was good for me. Uh, I went and it was scary. And I see your second one. Did you expect to spend time in Vietnam? Yes. Because right Vietnam was just hot. The president had just inserted 300,000 men in the, the 9th Marine Division in the Vietnam in October of 65. And so we all knew we were going in. When, you know, it's very, uh, you didn't have really a whole hell of a lot of choice. I remember going into the, to the federal building and after I got my letter, it says report at seven o'clock in the morning. And then walks this young man or older man, middle-aged man. I can't remember anymore, but he had this Yogi the Bear hat on. And he says, there was like 300 of us scared to death and didn't know what the hell to expect. He says, make three low rows. So we had 100 in each row. And he started walking down the aisle and said, Army, Marine, Navy, Air Force, Army, Marine, Navy. You didn't even have a choice of where you were going. That's how mm. desperate they were for us. So we go through the whole process of all day passing the test. And at the end of the day at 4.30 in the afternoon, he says, raise your right hand. So we all raise our right hand. Do you solemnly swear to protect the constitution of the United States? And all of us said, yes. He says, now you are now the property of the United States government. Uh, I want you all to go home, get a shaving kit. Don't bring any clothes. We're gonna give you some new wardrobe. And so we went home and they said, report back here at 7.30 in the morning. That's how fast it happened. Mm -hmm. So we went home, put our shaving kits together and reported at 7.30 and, and drove me down to uh, Fort Bliss, Texas. Um, did most of our training in White Sands, New Mexico. And we knew then that uh, it was gonna, it was serious. And they, they explained to us, pay attention. Um, you know, many people have their uh, personal opinions about basic training. But in my opinion, I think America has one of the, has the best trained soldiers in the world. That 13 weeks of basic training deals with just getting those who you cannot rely on when you need them in the, in the, in the foxhole with you or when you need them in a tight situation. So those that cry, there's nothing wrong with that. It's scary. It was scary for all of us. I was one of the older ones at 22 and not 18 to get drafted. And so, you know, when you hear a, a somebody crying in the background and they send them home right away. It wasn't because they were, uh, what I should not say, whatever disturbed or anything. They were afraid. Fear is real and it's there. And those who got sent home, it was good because we, I got in those situations where I had to rely on my buddies to pick me up on the other end. And the second part of it is the physical conditioning. And they do tremendous 14 to 16 to 18 hours a day of training in which I was already in good shape. So I, it just benefited me in, in, this, in the long sense. Second phase of us, they sent you home for a week or two to get rested. And then I reported to uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana for advanced infantry training. And uh, as, as, as it turned out there, uh, you go through another 13 weeks of uh, uh, advanced infantry specialty type uh, training. Uh, in case you didn't know that, Louisiana grows more rice than Vietnam does. It is really? colder than hell there, and it's wetter than hell, and those boar hogs are real as hell. They'll kill you. There are more poisonous steaks in Louisiana than there is in Vietnam, and so you can see that they come up with a good place. Uh, um, Did you go to Tigerland? Was it uh, called Tigerland? Did that's that it. Familiar? That was Tigerland. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was Vietnam. Uh, yeah, yeah. Was, was I saw the old. Uh, I saw the old sort of uh, arch. Still says like Tiger Land. If the world needed an animal, that was down a down perfect there. spot. Yeah. I mean, I it bet was. it was. What month were you down there? Do you remember? Was it like summer? Yeah, yeah. Oh. It was just yeah. August. Oh. July and August. I mean, it was. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. It was July and August, and so and they prepared you here again. It was specialty type training and what to expect. Uh, so that uh, kind of a semi a preliminary introduction. And so then, I mean, to show you how bad it was, the, in Fort Polk, Louisiana, it's uh, Leesville, Louisiana, population 500, not much there. Uh, airplane airfield is for maybe 100 troops at a time. There were 30,000 troops in Fort Polk, Louisiana at that time getting ready to go. 
So we wanted to get out of there so bad that six of us took a taxi cab from Fort Polk, Louisiana to Dallas, Texas. I get to Dallas, Texas, and I miss my flight by five minutes. And at that time, Dallas, Texas was a dry airport. You couldn't even get a damn beer. And so I was frustrated and I became, it was like festering at that point. Yeah. So anyway, long story short, again, we get home and we rest up another couple of days from the second phase of it. And we're ready to ship out to Vietnam. So in the interim, I'm on an old airline, Western Airlines. I get on the airplane and I sit right next to a Catholic priest. And I tell him the story. He sees me in my uniform. And I'm, I'm reporting to Oakland, California uh, for Travis Air Force Base. And if you're my age, 78, there were some old movies of World War II. And it was uh, the preliminary introduction, the longest day where guys were getting the word ready to go, go. And there were that many, the hangars at, at Fort, uh, not Fort Bush, help me, <laughs> Travis Air Force Base Travis. were just packed. The bunks were five high. We got there and uh, immediately they hear again, they issued new clothes. Um, new uh, fatigues, everything, weapons. We did get on a C-141 and flew out and we left Travis Air Force about five in the afternoon, ended up going to the Wake Islands, which is a considerable Japanese monument there. And the Wake Islands is one mile long and a half a mile wide. Only Just a little guy. Fueling, <laughs> fueling purposes only, but we landed about four in the morning. And, and the waves of the water were coming in. And here again, it referred back to those old movies when the guys were getting ready to go into combat. And this big monument is there, the water splashing up against it. And it, it talks about all of the, the heroic stands American took against the Japanese there to, to maintain that island. So then from there to Clark Air Force Base, immediately right, after we fuel. I got to interrupt you here. Like, how did yeah. that make you feel? Because you're right here at the peak of the training, right? You've been in the shoot. They're training you to go do the job, to go fight the nation's war. And growing up, I imagine sort of the, I don't know, idolization of that World War II generation as, I'm sure you guys looked up to all of them as they were Patriotic all the dads of everyone, all the, the mailman, everybody did that job. So Very like, what was that feeling like in your the pit stop of how real things were about what you were getting ready to go step off and do. I compare, I compare a lot of how my feelings were to the fear I had when I got shot. It was just as bad. It was, it was a, it's a fear that hard to explain. Nobody will really, really know. Nobody will ever know. Uh, very few wives and mothers know that feeling because we don't want to tell anybody how scared as hell we were yeah. when you get into those little black intense cloud. moments like that. So yeah. that it was very scary. It's scary is in the in the very large definition. I mean, uh, like I said, I was 22, and a lot of the kids were 18 and 19. And, uh, not 22. I was 21. I was a couple years younger, uh, older than most of them. But sure. a very fearful thing. And it gets worse as it goes because on the C-141, there's no windows except at the doors. In the plane, you don't sit forward. You sit backwards. You fly backwards into the area so that that's even a different and we're crowded there's 240 of us on this c-141 and so we get we go from there to clark air force base uh philippines the, huh that philippines yes in the philippines and then from right there short flight over to manila and they landed international manila international and they were have us all roped off separate from the people and that was here again late at night and it was just uh, another scary feeling because that, the next stop was Pleiku, Vietnam. Hmm. And when we got on the plane, each of the, uh, uh, the individuals that were in charge of us said, when we land, you will not walk off the plane, you will run off the plane. Uh, there are snipers in the area and people have been killed coming off the damn ramp. So you will run. And here again, we had our weapons. We were combat ready to go. It wasn't like get in your class A uniforms, fly United Airlines to uh, this wonderful part of America or, or the luxury parts of the world. Uh, we got there, we landed, and here again, we uh, within 12 hours, we were put on Chinooks 
and they flew us right about 19 clicks into on K Vietnam, which was my base camp. And uh, before I get into where I was actually uh, um, assigned to, I, my first assignment was with the fifth of the seventh cav, which is General Custer's old unit, fifth cav, seventh cav of the first cav division. And so my luck either started there or was meant to be, but I'm still around. I didn't get massacred. <laughs> I thought I did at one point, but I made it. So I see on, uh, and the third question, what was the process for joining the LERP unit? <clears throat> the fifth of the seventh had caught a whole lot of hell. And for those who were in Vietnam that are still alive, if they were familiar with Bong Song, Happy Valley, and all of the areas in that area, there was in the Central Highlands, and there was considerably battles going on, search and destroy missions constantly. So we, I had uh, my first mission after one week. When you land and you get your assignment with the fifth of the seventh, they immediately take you out for in what they call in country training. Uh, this is real live training. They give you, they make sure you know your weapon, they know what, you, what you've done and what you've trained for, but they take you out on a live mission to search and destroy or just a plain um, recon unit. You go out there and, and here again, my first mission was introduction to Vietnam was immediately uh, the fifth and seventh <laughs> first sergeant says, you're new here, but we want you there because you're fresh, freshly trained. And what we were going to do, they were going to put us at the top of this mountain. And an artillery unit had been there a number of months before us. Well, they were going to ship out and they wanted us to get on in behind the bushes, camouflage ourselves, and catch the scavengers that come in and get boxes, shells, any garbage that we may leave that may be benefit to them. So 15 minutes after the last uh, part of the artillery unit leaves, we're ambushed. There's six of us on top of the mountain and immediately I'm where I'm sitting, I had one of my men sitting on the left of me and one on the right of me and the uh, uh, patrol leader in, in front of me and two guys on, on the wings so of left and right. So immediately when the fire came in, the man on my left took a bullet under the arm or in this right front of the arm it came in his, blew his heart out to the front. Mm. And the fellow on the right of me was hit in, this, in the same side on the right side. And, the, and my patrol leader was hit in the gut. I'm right between every one of them and I didn't get hit. I'm a brand new rookie <laughs> specialist, private. And I got two new guys with me. And from my training, I had to, I had to get some fire superiority to let them know what the hell was happening. In the interim, the battalion chief is up above and he knows that there's high intensity of enemy there. So what I did is all I did is holler to the guys, throw your grenades to the center. And they did. And I just started on throwing them all around us. And then we took our M16s at that time and started firing into it. And that, I, that was my First week into Vietnam and my first oh, yeah. citation, which was an army common army commendation medal with the V device, and uh, that was my introduction to Vietnam, and that was the early September of '66. So, so then Septem we, September of '66, it was a, a big battle in history of the Vietnam War. Is I drank, and that would have been about a year prior, but that was the Seventh Cavalry as well, right? Those are some of that uh, was that Elmore, Elmore, and and uh, Miller. Uh, the bottom line of that is I was wounded. We were wounded just uh, about 17 clicks from that. And it was nine and a half. The Idrain Valley was the first uh, insertion of helicopters into Vietnam where you had 300 guys that were or 400 guys who were originally supposed to be on the ground. And only got 170 guys on the ground, I guess. But the bottom line of that is that was the same area. It was the hottest battle ever. And uh, a lot was learned and a lot not learned from it. Uh, mm. uh, but uh, let's, let's, were you I'm fighting, trying to get um, back. Were you fighting NVA or is this Viet Cong? No, most, most, and, and mostly the trained, are, are the RVs. These were the trained guys. These yeah. were the guys like Army Rangers. These, 
Uh, they knew their shit and they were, they were probably better guerrilla warfare than the, see, there's two types of Viet, uh, Viet Cong. You had the black pajama guy that was usually the villager that was forced to go fight from the RVs, the, the regular Vietnam veterans, mm -hmm. not veterans, soldiers. Sure. Um, the, the Republic of Vietnam had real barbaric training. I mean, they, they, they were almost, I guess if you were to compare them to the SS in Germany, they had no mercy. There was, they were tough and they were good. I mean, uh, I, I don't think people really understand the statistics of Vietnam. Of the 58,000 men that died in Vietnam, 38,000 men were dead the first four years of that war. We were sending bodies home in America, 200 a week dead, and almost twice that, three times that, wounded. Uh, so after the 158, after the 58,000 men died, after all the, the completion of the war, there were 176,000 of us disabled veterans sure. hanging out. Uh, and that's, those are approximate numbers, mm -hmm. uh, the numbers that I have, but they're pretty damn close. So anyway, being assigned and getting that medal and doing my first mission, that's when I was the, your third question, what was the process for joining the LERP unit? Uh, <clears throat> Captain, at that time, Captain James D. James, who was uh, a, a, a scholar, a professor, an excellent, he, was, he knew special forces, he knew rangers, he knew the ins and outs of battle and the, the, the strategy of how to do it. Uh, those statistics I just gave you tells you that the Viet Cong, they were literally kicking our ass around that first four years of the war. At that time, the general, general said, James, <laughs> put together some LERP units and let's get some Rangers out there to kick some ass and take some names. That's, he puts it that way too. LERP so, as in long range reconnaissance. Long range reconnaissance patrols. And their mission was to go out and find the enemy. So in essence, my... Uh, how I was selected first, James came to the 5th and the 7th because I consider that we were probably the meanest son of the bitches there. I, I, I just say that because but I think every unit says that. But we were. We, we were there. I had already one week and I had already won. I would give, awarded a medal. Give me a break. I couldn't even brush my teeth or shave at that time. And, and here I'm killing people and almost damn near dying myself. So he selected it. James selected the first 14 guys out of uh, seven out of my unit. Wow. And, uh, hand selected. And uh, we were the first, I was the first team of the Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol or the first CAV division in 1966. Oh, wow. So here again, the training did stop and we had uh, where we did in country Rakondo school to become that LERP ranger. Yeah. Well, I didn't have time to go to the Rakondo school. Shit, we were fighting a battle. I was learning how to be a ranger by two guys that were there. We were certified right there. <laughs> we did the live thing. So uh, if you know what a LERP ranger mission is, usually the odds are really highly against you. They would insert us in my case, when I got shot April 23rd, we were surrounded by three companies of Viet Cong regulars and six of us against them. That's how intense it was. So those were the type of missions. We, they wanted to put us in hot spots where they were. And if you know a ranger unit, each ranger is given a job. You have a medic, you have a patrol leader, you have a point scout to get you in where you're going. Second ranger is in charge of terrain. Third ranger is in charge of water, what kind of water accessory. Third, fourth ranger, and so on, so on. So you can see each of us were given a job of what to do so that we can come back and, and report the information to how to apply troops in to fight these guys. Uh, that was my duty, and we did that. Uh, like I said, I was only in Vietnam eight and a half months, but I fought every, I was, there was no, R and R. There was no for me. There was no R and R. Um, it was it was just one of those uh, types of mission that James put it in such a ways. It's such a premeditated courage of all of the guys uh, to go in there and do that type of job. Uh, 
that's where the basic training is, where you better rely on your buddy next to you. Uh, when it happens, it happens. Uh, should I keep going on? I kind of lost train of where well, I was at. I have a question there. So was the intent of your missions to identify enemy locations so another unit, a larger unit could come in? So right. if you got but, in contact, it wasn't, your goal wasn't to go out and get into a fight. Just, our intent was never to make contact. Gotcha. If, if, if the Viet Cong would have captured a uh, ranger unit like that, it would be the highlight of the day. They, I mean, we changed our name four different times uh, as we, we came in there as H, they had labels on, we were posters on us. They had us marked and ready to go. I mean, the first time I was there, we were at H Company 75th Rangers. And then it was the E2, H, E2, da, 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 da. And then we finally ended up with 191st Military Intelligence. And so that was the last. But it was always H Company, uh, H75, the 75th Rangers. Um, Underneath the 7th ID. Uh, the the fifth, first yeah, all under, uh, well, the 1st Cav Division. I went first Cav. Fifth, I went from the 5th of the 7th Cav to under the 1st right. Cav Division. You have a division of 13,000 men, and each has one to 13 uh, different battalions. Uh, so when we got there, it's a total different classification. Like I said, we were uh, 191st military intelligence for the first cap. So that G2 rating is like uh, right under a CIA or something like that, because we reported to James. James went right next door to the general, said, this is what we found. It's a very it's sneaky way of naming it, calling it a military intelligence organization. It's it very sucks. sneaky. It's, yeah. it's all name. It's, uh, yeah. But uh, if, uh, Ray, if uh, Viet Cong you know, would have brought down, um, uh, captured a, a ranger unit, that would be the gold star on your flag, and they would get a month vacation in Hawaii. <laughs> but that uh, they never got us. They shot us, but they didn't get us. I mean, uh, we were trained enough to take care of each other. And when one screwed up, the other one caught him and, and straightened it out right away. But uh, we never had to do that. Uh, um, how long were these patrols? Like, how were, you in, how, how were you inserting into these areas? Yeah. And then and, how long uh, were you staying on patrol? It was very, uh, it was an unusual such. Jim Bracewall was the chopper pilot assigned to us. <clears throat> we had eight choppers sitting right outside wow. our tent next to the general's tent. Everything was in one little area. I mean, when it came time to go, you go. Jim Bracewell was the captain, or at that time, yeah, he was a captain too, I think. No, he was a major, I think, assigned to us. And he would do what they call, because we had to go treetop level in the intensity of, uh, of, of the mission, when we were when we got shot, we were about twenty five clicks out, which is Barry max range of a PRC twenty five radio. I mean, that's the max range. Mm -hmm. But here again, we had on our missions, and when I was assigned there, we had the very first AR fifteens. Our Ranger team and the Navy SEAL team and the Commando team were the first ones to start using that AR fifteen. Along with that AR fifteen, we were able to get the new radios that came out, the directional antennas. But we didn't want that because you had to climb a damn tree and point that arrow towards the to the base camp for community. It was just new, but it ain't worth a shit. And so the PRC twenty five was our lifeline. It heavy as hell to carry, and sure. my radio man was killed right away immediately. So you can see why it was important. But it had an extendable cord on it, <clears throat> and I'll tell you how it went. Uh, should I get into April 23rd on the mission? Yeah, go for it. Let's go back. I'm, I apologize. So the night before a mission, Jim Bracewell, the patrol leader, and Captain James D. James and the executive officer, they did a flight, distance flight time out there. Instead of direction of 40 degrees, uh, any, uh, any of the instrument reading, he did a time flight in a direction. And that was the point of or in a general vicinity of how close he could get us because nighttime and then here again when they insert us we go at the last daylight and get out when we get spotted 
but he would do that. And Jim Bracewell was, oh, he was, he was, he was the, he's still alive. We still communicate with him. And uh, there's three of us Rangers that are still left out of the six. <clears throat> the, um, so that the pattern of us is a reconnaissance the night before, because we never got to get our missions until last minute when something would pop, the general said we needed da 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 da. Sure. And so we did that under you know the intelligence that was given to us. And so boom uh, on the 22nd or 21st, 22nd we're inserted, the 23rd we're hit. I mean, so we uh, boom, 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 like in order. Uh, it was almost like there's a whole scenario of events that take place up to actually getting shot, but I'll go right to when we got shot at 6.30 in the morning. Four of us are laying down flat on the ground. There's no foxhole because you don't have time to do that crap. You know, Ranger, you get in the bush and the tree or whatever you're at. So I'm laying down on my back right here. My radio man's on back of me. His feet are touching my shoulders so we don't talk. If action happens, he kicks me. The medic is touching me on the right here. And the point scout, Bill Carpenter, is sitting on back of him. So there's four of us in a cluster. And here again, one on each side of, of the patrol. So at 6.30 in the morning, the, the, the first shots start coming in all at once. And everybody was hit at the same time. If you can imagine everybody getting hit at the same time, I turn around this way to my right to look at the sea of Bill. And the first bullet went right between my fingers and threw my hand down, all the way down. The second bullet hit me in the back of the shoulder that went all the way through, but it spun me all the way around over to my stomach. Okay, now this is all in seconds. I'm given the slow yeah. scenario of events. Mm -hmm. It flips me on my stomach. Then I'm, I'm faced with this eye and this shoulder facing Bill, who's on my back right next to the radio man and a grenade blows up and a piece of grenade shrapnel hits me in the shoulder. Normally it's small microscopic soft, small stuff because it's just a grenade. And this must have been a dud because there was a big two inch piece of shrapnel that was still in there burning like hell. So I grabbed that thing and just pull it out. And just as soon as I pull it out, they hit me in the left leg, faced around, I'm on my belly, and my left leg with a 45 slug from a grease gun and flips me back around. So Can't catch a break. Playing, they're playing with this. Now, mind you, that's just me. In the interim, the radio man is hit with a burst of AK-47s and his head is just split open. Mm -hmm. Okay, the medic is hit from the, this direction with six or seven slugs in the gut. And Bill gets hit in the eye, the jaw, the three in, and three in the back. And a grenade blows up. So he is, his eyeball is hanging out. And I look over to him and he picks the son of a bitch, puts it back in his eye. And mm -hmm. so that's, that's the 20 seconds. If that sounds out yeah. of perspective, it's not. It seemed like five months, but it was boom, 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 boom. So now, if you don't believe in adrenaline, it's there. Mm -hmm. It works to your benefit because every human being is given what I call survival instincts that when you mostly get into a situation and if you're trained in it, you will get out of it if it's possible. So we're hit, all of us are hit. John's over here and they've got Claymore. We set a Claymore mine and you know, you're familiar with the Claymore mine. Yes. Mm -hmm. Big landmine that this scatter about 900 Bulbarians have go at a very powerful range. We set it sideways because the backfire could burn us up if it blow us up if we were facing it. And he, he, after he, we were hit, he scatters that that landmine, and you could just hear the Bulbarians gone and the screams from the other side. Now understand the enemy is like 15 meters away, or 15 yards away from me. I'm looking at him. Well, I had that car 15, but I also carried an M79 grenade launcher for identification so we can get, you know, to get picked up or mm -hmm. plain old grenades into an area that we needed. So the bottom line is these, these people that are 15 yards away, 
they start coming at us. I get that grenade. I didn't have a shell in there for flares. I had buckshot in there. And I aimed it right at the people as they were starting. Like I said, enemy will get you down. And once we were hit, they didn't know the other two guys were there. They came up and they were ready. I was ready to do hand-to-hand -hand combat after I'd been shot, shot up the way I was. Mm. And so as they started to come, I fired that M79. And here again, that M79 grenade launcher has a canister in it, but it's got to go about, about 70 meters before it ignites and, and it becomes triggering point. Fortunately, I don't know what the hell happened, but they started coming. I fired it and it hit. And right there... It was the nightmare that I have and suffered through my post-traumatic is it hit this gal right in the chest and I had the bloodiest female scream of my life. And there were two females on each side of them and it just tore them all three out. So between the three of them screaming like bloody murder, unless you've heard of female, well, they, those were females that were attacking us as far as we could tell. In the NVA. I, am, I did not know that at all. Yeah, a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't know. A lot of the, if you remember some of the films where young children were running and putting grenades into gas tanks and in Saigon where the little girl was sure. napalm running down the street, but they used these girls, they used children as decoys. That's why I say they're as barbaric as hell and they could care less about whether you're male or female or a child or an old man. If you can walk and talk, you carry a weapon and you do the damage. So these these were trained gals, though. These were we were these were our Vietnam Viet Cong regulars. The right, the uniformed They're regulars. Uniforms. Yeah. And so I took that out, but in the meantime, uh, boom, 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 boom. It just you just continued to go. So after that's over with, we finally make uh, to go back to regress here just a little bit. When David was still standing and I could see him standing, whatever the shock or the gunfighter to see what was going on. And then he's hit, he falls down right next to me and he's damn near in my arms. And so in the meantime, I said, throw me the headset, David, throw me the headset so that I can make contact with base camp. Mm -hmm. I started to do that and got in, made base camp, Jim Bracewell heard that. Well, every unit that's out in the field like that, like we are, they have what they call QRF, Quick Reactionary Forces. Well, Quick Reactionary Forces heard us, but they heard the call for help that we were hit and we needed to be extracted immediately. They were busy jacking around and, and, and didn't, up, didn't respond immediately to the, to the call. And mm -hmm. I won't go into what Captain James at that time said, or how I knew I thought he was saying, but Jim Bracewell, the chopper pilot that was assigned to us, heard the call. And he comes in over there and he tells his, he, that we this is after the fact, I didn't hear it, but he's telling his two gunners, we can go in and get three out alive or six dead in the morning. Hmm. So the gunner said, let's go. So they yeah. came in, they came in without Cobras or anything, no gunships, nothing. They came in ballsy, that's why, Chopper pilots and these gunners got very little recognition. They did, and I'll tell you, I can't tell you, I can't even imagine how many men they saved just by responding like that. So anyway, long story short here, Jim coming in for us and he tells this, get ready, I'm going to be picking in. And we tell him it's hot zone, it's, it's burning here. And so he says, we don't care, we're coming up. Well, we're about 500 feet down from the top of the mountain. He, he's hovering at the top of the mountain because there's tree stumps there and he can't land that baby. Mm -hmm. He's hovering. Doug Fletcher, who was still alive at that time, picks up Bill Carpenter, who was eye hanging out and still kicking, weighs 225 pounds. Fletcher weighs 200 pounds and he picked him up and carrying like there was nothing up the top of the hill. John, Johnny Simonis picks up <clears throat> the medic guy. And he carries him up to the top. Fletcher runs back down to get David Ives, who is the radio man. I'm the last one there. And I said, go. I was hit on both shoulders, the leg, and here. But that adrenaline part that I told you about, told you about gave me the capability to fight. 
and I used that car 15 as a crutch and I walked to the top of the hill where they were just loading and they were just throwing us on top of the chop chopper like sacks of potatoes. I, I make eye contact with the chopper with Jim and I'm red from here down. Every time I'm taking a breath, the blood squirting out of my right shoulder and I'm just soaked red. And how I walked up that hill with that crutch of AR-15 and he looked at me and I don't know what he saw. 15 years ago, we had a ranger reunion in, in Louisville, Kentucky. A man comes up behind me, he taps me on the shoulder. He says, do you know who I am? And I said, no, do you know who I am? He says, yeah, you're Artie Guerrero. I picked you up when you got shot. And I says, how in the hell did you know it was me? He says, do you remember that hill and you were looking at me? You had that shit eating grin on your face. That's what you got on your face right now. And, mm -hmm. that, and that's the, uh, the thrust of it. I have to show you something. I'm going to get it up here right now. Because, yeah. Uh, By the way, that was the best part of anything you could have just described is that you got to talk to the helicopter pilot just a mere 15 years ago, and you're still in touch. I love that. We still, we talk once a week. There's Love it. Okay, yeah, hold great. on one second. And... and the reason I'm having a hard time because I only put, oh, here it is. Can you see it? Up a little further. Holy cow. Is that's, that, that's the bird that you are. He, Jim, never showed us that picture until three years ago. He figured that enough of us went through enough shit that we didn't have to see this. And now that we're all dying off, he wanted us to see. The fire came upward. Mm -hmm. If it had hit the rotors, the chopper had been down. When they had us stacked on top of each other, and I was the last one on top, and that chopper took off, these gunners opened up, held the fire. And I thought we were being attacked again. I thought we were back on the ground fighting again, and they took off. As we're flying out, you could see all of the cobras coming in finally to give us some hand. And sure. The, the shit had already been done and, and taken care of. My goodness. But that's, let me see if I can. A good book, one of our ranger guys that was assigned to our unit, Craig J.P. Jorgensen, K, or Craig with a K, read Ghost of the Highlands. I think I sent you some of the cover of the book. The Ghost of the Highlands, read it. Go to chapter 18, it'll tell you that mission on April 23rd, 1967. Um, and then there's a, a one of the books that uh, Bill Carpenter wrote Bill Carpenter was the guy that had the eyeball hanging out. And mm -hmm. he writes a book uh, telling the same story I just told you, but in his version. Wow. And you have to understand when you read these books and you hear me talk, it's like five people being at the traffic accident and you have five different versions. Sure, oh, sure. It's pretty much, yeah. this is pretty much the same. There, he, he, we, I mean, we're that far apart instead of this far apart. But what he did in his book, which is a little bit thicker, he, he interviews about a hundred of us, maybe I can, a, a large number of us for a paragraph of what their experiment or experiences were. You have to get that book. I'll check yeah. that out. I've got the one here, Ghost of the Highlands pulled up. What was the other one? I'm going to get it for you right now. Okay. Yeah, I've got the Ghost of the Highlands pulled up. Yeah, that's interesting. Lurps of the Vietnam. I, I'm glad that those guys wrote that book too, because it's from firsthand knowledge. Now, this uh, this John Laburn, he was he didn't write the story. Bill wrote the story, but John needed his name to get the thing published or something at Got that it. time. A revision's been out already, but the historical occurrences. But this, there's all of us. Uh, my understanding, the numbers were like. Uh, from my first two 14 guys, 1,100 guys went through it from September of 66 until 73 when they were extracted. There we go. Art, on, on the second page of that book, 
Team one, Ooh. Art Guerrero. You see me on that You're page? Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like the second page of the book. Uh, With Ron Christopher, John Simones. Yeah, Christopher, I, that's a different story. I won't go into him. He was supposed to be our seventh guy, but didn't end up going with us. And he was uh, he was a tab ranger, but for all the circumstances, he was not on that mission with us. Uh, Johnny Simonis, uh, Doug Fletcher, um, Jeff, Jeffrey. Coper, uh, Coper, Copper. Cop, Coper. And Dick and Spina. Medic. Huh? And Dick. Uh, Richard, Dick Spina didn't go with us. We had, um, that's where Bill Carpenter and uh, David Ives, who was killed immediately, the radio man, that was their first mission and last mission. Hmm. and David Ives, the radio man, has the same birthday as I, August 12th, and Jim Bracewell and John Simonis have the same birthday dates, so the chopper pilot and the man and two of us on the same team had the same birthday. Uh, David was, would have been 70, I was, hell, I was 22 when I got shot, so David was two years younger than me, but uh, read, read those stories, I think, yeah, uh, that ranger unit was the most decorated. If you go to the back of the Ghost of the Highlands, is the most decorated ranger unit in history. No kidding. And let me show, let me see if I can. Well, do you know my, Craig I, Jorgensen? I received the Army Commendation Medal with a V device for heroism. I received a silver star for that mission. Hmm. And then I received the Purple Heart, of course. And I received the United States Air Medal. Uh, Air Medal, usually ground troops don't get them because uh, you have to do over 125 aerial flights into an insecure area. And uh, I got, they give it all of us. I mean, it, my experiences probably were like nobody else. I don't claim to be any uh, different than any of the guys. I just know the, the courage that it takes to, to do something away from the normal, what we take for granted. Sure. I've been everywhere. I've been to Vietnam, to China. I've been to Cuba. Uh, I've done a lot of things in my lifetime, but there's no place like here. The only worst experience that I had, other than getting shot, was that I spent 67 days in Camp Cooey Hospital in Okinawa, where the first symptom of MS showed up. Then they put me on an airplane and took me to Tachikawa, Japan for another 20 days. And then they flew me on a C-141 back home, but there wasn't 241, there was 150 of us on stretchers and IVs and what have you. And we landed at Travis Air Force Base to the worst experience of my whole lifetime. And I hope many Americans will listen to what I'm going to say. When we got there, we were hollered. Half the guys weren't even conscious. They were comatose and out. And these son of a bitch and students at Berkeley University hollered baby killers and were spitting on us as they carried us off the plane. Never forget that as long as I live. And I know that those students are the only ones, not all of the students there, but those group of students that pulled that shit off on American troops I hope they have to answer to somebody at the end of their lifetime. That was the worst experience. And from that time on, it's been a battle. That's why I made the promise at that time to my guys that died there and were wounded with me that I would advocate for the rest of my life until finally a couple of years ago, I had to give it up because you know what? Not a damn thing has changed in the VA system in 56 years with the exception of one thing. And thanks to me and a few other guys that were under chapter 38 of the Veterans Administration rule book. Chapter 38 says that it will take care of us and those of us that are, have uh, special needs like spinal cord injury. And see the difference that people don't understand spinal cord injury wards is that when you go to that ward, you need two and a half professional people to take care of you instead of mainstream hospital where it's one-on-one. -on -one. And why do you need two and a half? Because a lot of us are quads, not me, but quads, 
and some of them don't have the capability of turning over. Most of us in wheelchairs that die, die from skin issues, decubious ulcers, because you're not turned over. Mm -hmm. That's where you need the two and a half professional people. And we fight with our congressmen and our senators every year to help improve that. And not only that, caregivers, if you have the opportunity to ever get into caregivers, do the best because without them, we don't live. My wife has to dress me, feed me, put me to bed, poop me, clean my urine up. And her life is taken away. Not just my wife, but other caregivers too. So if you ever get a chance to podcast, go into caregivers. They, and they need, congressmen need to understand uh, the importance of us not I don't want to be in a hospital the rest of my life. I want to stay home and die here. And if I could die here or be in the comfort of my home like I am right here, uh, I hope I have a story for you guys. I hope I have a story for you guys. This is incredible. I'm not sure Artie, where I, to go now. Well, Artie, I, I want to say yeah. I my experience with the VA is is a fraction of what yours is. Um, it, but you know, I, I don't, so I don't know what's changed, what's gotten better, what hasn't gotten better, but I don't think it's fair to say that things haven't gotten better just broadly because that experience that you and your, your fellow brothers in arms had coming off the plane in California, we didn't say, and I did not experience that. Um, and we didn't experience that coming back from Afghanistan, not because of some change, the VA, not because of some change politicians did, but because of you and other veterans that made that story known and made sure that, I mean, I, I remember getting off planes for a uh, block leave coming back from Afghanistan and all the people, and it was a group of Vietnam veterans who were there. Um, they didn't know me, it was in Atlanta. I'm not from Atlanta. It was just this random group of soldiers and there were a hundred Vietnam veterans on a random Tuesday night. It wasn't anything special. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. That, that's incredible. And I wish I, I wish I could sit here as a Vietnam veteran and say, you know what, I, I wish it was that way, but I have to disagree with you because I'm talking from experience right here to this day as a 78 year old man, competent mentally. That's the only, you know, thank God. I think God gave me a mouth to talk with because <laughs> as I go in for my appointments at this brand new damn facility that could have only cost 385 million that cost one, $1. $1.7 billion to fix. And I roll in to get my wheelchair fixed and I, said, has anything changed to this individual? He says, Art, it's the same old shit. They're running it like a business and not like hospital. Hmm. I'm not saying everybody. I'm saying my experience in a brand new hospital. And if you don't have anything wrong with you and you just need to go in for an examination or something like that, that's one thing. But if you have a catastrophic disease or an injury or some of these pit feel or uh, burn pits. There's a different story. I mean, how long? Look at 50 years for them to recognize that Agent Orange is finally. Who knows that that shit didn't create my multiple sclerosis and all the other diseases? We know sure. that uh, you know soft tissue sarcoma didn't just start by itself. I know how healthy I was when I left. I'm not taken away from it. Like I said, I never complained about the service of the VA. I bitched about the process. Get the hospitals built if you need them. Mm -hmm. If you're going to send us to war, then damn well stick up to what the Constitution says. They'll take care of you. Lincoln. Lincoln was the only, his saying, and it, it was taken away when Reagan was elected president. If you went into a VA hospital, it set up on the wall there. Let he who bore the pain of battle be taken care of in their spouses. When Reagan went into office, that damn sign came down. Hmm. And it's been down since then. So I know the story of what they do and what they don't do from a catastrophic physical condition. And thank God that the MS is spinal cord injured, physical and not cognitive, because I don't forget that much. As you can see, I can articulate pretty damn well, and I watch the damn process happen. They don't give us anything. We have to ask for it, and sometimes we have to beg for it. And, and you, I, I, 
You've made some. Say, there are individuals, though. And I have to tell you, I remember the doctors that put me in the position that I am and said, look, we know we've taken away some of your independence, but either you have it or it has you. Well, I've got it. And I'm dealing with it. You know, I didn't mean to take away the glory of, I'm sure veterans have, they have because what we bitched about. Exactly. Yes. Yes. I think that's what we're saying is it's Mm -hmm. not a perfect system or even ideal. It's big. It's big. It's, it, it's a, it's the bureaucracy definitely. But like, I think what Preston's getting at is think how long it took for agent orange to happen, right? For that 50 years, like you're talking about and the burn pit issue took a long time, but it, but it only took about 10 years. It didn't take 50. And without the agent orange advocacy, there would be no pact act today. And, and the burn pit sort of registry and thing going on, I don't think. And like, and I think another thing, especially the tragedy that is Vietnam, and it's like you were a draftee, you know, and that's really important. It's really important that you didn't want to go. Um, you were ordered by the government. They forced you to do these things, you know, and I know you said you had options, maybe. But at the end of the day, it was the government ordering you to go do these things. Exactly. And for the treatment that you received when you came home, I mean, it's just, it's, it's just despicable. Now, everybody has a right to an opinion, of course. Absolutely. That's part of America, that's, too. That's one it's of just the reasons disappointing. I went. It's disappointing, you know, and it's just, for me, I have an opinion, too, right? And mine, you know, it's shameful and, and just sort of the worst, because I'm saying, take that anger and do what you're doing with it. Point the finger in the government's chest. You know, they're the ones who are culpable of all of these things. You know, you're talking to, I'm going to read the quote again. We we said it before the thing recorded. This is George Washington. So it goes all the way back to the beginning. The willingness with which our young people are likely to serve in any war, no matter how justified, shall be directly proportional to how they perceive veterans of earlier wars were treated and appreciated by our nation. And it's just so true that, see, Sometimes we're blind for nearness of the forest. If, if, you're, if you ask somebody in a wheelchair, or no, let's take a, 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 a regular able body, well, healthy individual, looks at an individual in a wheelchair, and they just think the paralysis end of it, but it's much more than that. And then they think, well, okay, but they forget about who has to take care of us. That's another, sure. you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure those things out. And service organizations have done well to combat the system and they've done well, but there's still that little lax of of the burn pits and the the things, the small stuff that was always there. It's like going back to World War II where you had mustard gas and, you know, just the different, there's a chemical involved in every theater. Sure. I mean, and it's killing us. Point. There's no place I'd rather live than right here. I'm 78. I'm on borrowed time now, even as healthy as my mouth works. But I'm not afraid to die. And I just want every, my legacy. I wish the draft would come back. I wish I could, something I could do to make it come back. And why? Because it scares me to know that there's just 1% of our population that's willing to go to the service and protect this country. 1%! Are we such a greedy nation that, I know technology is there and the reason for that. Now they send six-man SEAL teams and Ranger teams out to do the work of 150 men, but you still need numbers to make power to let other countries know that we are. Uh, Ukraine is a good example. Our our F-22 and F-35 jet planes that are, you know, people don't even know about them. Yet we know the power of those things as opposed to the Spitfire or the F-100s. You know, some of the pilots that we had to go in and get out of there sometimes. <laughs> I mean. Well, it's a business now. I mean, that's my take it on is. it, right? And you, the VA is that way too. Yeah. The, you know, With those elite so units, many... they're almost too professional, right? They're so yeah. professional, we're kind of the imperial redcoats in a way. That's how I view it. It's not the citizen, 
the citizen soldier model, I think that was uh, inherent at our like conception. It's just transformed after World War II because yeah. we just tied, we are so tied to economic prosperity and war. And well, we just haven't if stopped. You, if it you pays the, the bills. It's, it's our responsibility as citizens of this country to know that a million and a half people have died to make it free for 240 years. And many mm -hmm. hundred thousands have paid half that ultimate price. And do we know how many missing in action troops from World War II? Well, there's 77,000 men still missing from that war. Wow. Mm -hmm. Do we know Korea? Wow. There's 8,000 men still unaccounted for from Korea. And then of course the 2000 in Vietnam, I mean, those are the things that, that, that make me mad that well, Americans don't know. Well, not all, but pretty much all. I mean, did you uh, know that? Preston, did yeah. you I, know I did not. I did not know those numbers, but I'm excited okay. that more people are going to hear those numbers now after listening to this. Yeah. And, I, and, and I put think big it, red letters in there. Make sure they see it. Uh, I, know I think I it goes back to it. the Berkeley comment, too, like, when it comes to like the criticism, because you're talking about every war having chemicals and whatnot, and and all of these uh, missing in action, and the 1.5 million that have died in this sort of these course of events, and then to me, sort of the thing is always going back to the question of should we be there in the first place, right? What, why are we putting boots on ground, right? The need to draft people to put them in harm's way, where they're you know in the middle of nowhere and they've got two. Vietnamese women shooting at them on an ambush and killing their friends, you know, like, why are we putting these situations, why are we have, allowing them to happen to begin with and putting ourselves in these situations where these toxic chemicals are, we're being exposed to all this death and destruction and mayhem, right? Now, I'm not saying don't do it ever, but it's always that question, though, when and we do it, we control, do it, and do we need to, right? You could throw the question out that I just told you. Those, not question, the statement, those who send us to war never have to go to war. Yeah. Why don't we send Mr. Lindsey Graham there? Let's, right. let's see what Mr. Graham does. Let's send Mr. You. Mike, uh, Mitch McConnell there and say, I'm with you. a little touch of basic training to do to that little old fart. I'm I with mean, you. you know, I have no mercy for any of them. And I accuse Democrats as long with Republicans and independents. Give me a break. If you're going to send us, then take care of us when we come back and our families. We're sensitive. We're human beings. We're mothers and fathers and grandparents, brothers and sisters. If you can send $500 billion to the bridge to nowhere, Miss Alaska and Mr. Alaska, then you sure enough can spend 55 cents to make Artie walk. Maybe, maybe not now. You can like see I'm, I'm not prejudiced and I'm not candid. I'm very candid. But I'm not shy to call any one of the pilots. I, I admire those. Uh, I'm really sorry that Gary Hart is not around, that didn't make president because he was a veterans politician. He's the one that made the judicial review bill possible. So I know there's some care there. And uh, there are other politicians that have, that have done that. Art, that was awesome. I, I thank you. So go ahead, Sarah. I was just going to say that that was more than expected. I want to leave it on a positive note because I do think things are changing. I don't think we died on the arbitrary hills in our wars the way you guys did necessarily. I like that we did it without a draft, actually. We have way fewer casualties, and we don't have any that I know of missing in action. You know, so to me, those are sort of improvements. Now, what's that look like on the domestic front? I don't, you know, I can't, I'm not smart enough there. But when it comes to politicians, too, I, I agree with you. I say amen to that. But we already talked about Jason Crow earlier. He's doing good stuff. Oh, I was involved wonderful. with the Afghan evac last summer. He was heavily involved with that too. Um, and he's in, he's in a real position with a spotlight on. And he is sort of leading from the front with his mouth and his actions. And so they're out there. And so we just need to get more of them. Oh, to, yeah, I, I, I agree. There. Jason Crow, Tammy Duckworth, she's got more balls than most men. I mean, she does. She's just criminally. There's she a does. lady that I would fly with any day. I mean, she had, must have been one hell of a chopper pilot or, you know, a Blackhawk. She was a pilot. You knew that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. She was a Blackhawk pilot and had more balls than most men do. War hero. <laughs> Straight up war hero. 
No yeah. doubt about that. And there are many mind. more. There are many more. And I appreciate that you guys give me the opportunity to do this. I'm not sure. I, I tried to read up a little bit more on on the uh, what takes place in October and uh, with Kim, Kimberly. Yeah. And I, so I, I hope don't... that's what she wanted. And, uh, you know, I think it was her uncle that was a LERP ranger. That's awesome. And the rangers here uh, went to visit his grave when they had the convention here. Uh, I didn't get real, I've been always been active, but I just, war stories just don't turn me on anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I did a lot of public speaking at schools only for the mere fact of educating youngsters and to be appreciative of, of what our people, our guys did. You know what we've noticed, Artie, is that, um, we use Kim as the example here, is sometimes not everybody can tell their story, whatever it is. Some, some people have, you've got a, a crazy story. Most people don't have that. Um, but any story at all, just a funny story about basic training, maybe. There's so many people whose relatives, family members, parents, brothers and sisters had very similar circumstances, but cannot articulate that for any number of reasons. Maybe they're not with us anymore. Maybe they just don't share. So people that you don't know that I don't know will hear your story and it'll be a place filler for their father's story that they never told. We'll give them a little insight into flying to Vietnam. What was that like? Um, so it, it fills in for a lot of other people, which I think is really cool. Yeah. Mark, uh, if you want uh, another part, uh, uh, Ed Perlmutter, the congressman here in Colorado, uh, started the uh, oh, Library of Congress where veterans are starting to tape. If you go to Library of Congress, and pull up uh, the stories we we our stories or something like that. Artie Guerrero, you might pull up. There were four of us that were interviewed: a World War II seaman, um, oh God, uh, Tuskegee Airman, oh, wow. uh, Korea veteran officer, uh, and uh, a black nurse, uh, Martha. And Martha and I are the only two alive out of the sixth. Uh, but it individual stories of, of veterans that live here in Colorado. Uh, yeah. What do you think, guys? It was what awesome. Here, I'm going to hit the stop button.